really I'm Napoleon, I've come to stop the show. I'm very pleased to be here, but I think you ought to know. I only came to tell you that it's time for me to go. The battle is heaving. Good to see you, now I'm leaving. Hail Napoleon. Ah, emperor of the world, what is there left for me to conquer? Go to the North Pole, go to Africa. Go to Mexico, fight anybody. What, and leave my darling Josephine alone with the court? Napoleon, how can you doubt my love? Forgive me, my queen. When I look into your beautiful eyes, I know that you are true to the French army. I only hope it remains a standing army. And now I must not tarry. I'm off, and if I leave you here with them, I must be off. That was Noah Diamond playing the inimitable Groucho Marx in Noah's revival, restoration, recreation of the Marx Brothers' first full Broadway show, I'll Say She Is. Hello and welcome to episode 111 of the Occasional Film Podcast, the occasional companion podcast to the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog. I'm the blog's editor, John Gasper. In today's episode, we've got a couple of grouchos sitting around chatting. Writer and performer Noah Diamond is joined by my occasional co-host, Jim Cunningham, to discuss something they both have in common the pleasures and pain of portraying Groucho Marx. Noah Diamond is a New York-based writer, performer, designer, podcaster, and the author of the terrific book, Give Me a Thrill, The Definitive History of I'll Say She Is. Jim Cunningham is a Twin Cities-based actor and corporate MC. He's the producer of the annual production of It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play at the St. Paul Hotel, as well as being the feast master and the host of the Phantom's Feast at the Minnesota Renaissance Festival. What do these two fellows have in common? They're also a couple of grouchos, and on today's show, they're just sitting around chatting. Let's go back to the beginning. We'll start with Noah, then we'll go to Jim. What's your earliest memory of Groucho Marx or the Marx Brothers? Well, for me, it started in a kind of roundabout way when I was a very little kid, uh, before I could even read, um, I was really interested in books. And uh, I had my collection of, you know, Dr. Seuss and all the books that would be read to me. But what I really liked to do was go downstairs where my parents had in the living room, bookshelves lining the walls. And their books were really interesting to me. I just knew there were uh, secrets there. You know, they had like big art books and books of poetry and I, I, maybe my first experiences with words were looking at the spines of the books in the living room. And one of the books they happened to have was a then fairly recent book, Joe Adamson's Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Sometimes Zeppo. Oh, oh, yeah. Which is, um, I think most Marx Brothers fans would, would say it's um, the best loved book about them, certainly, and I think uh, the best written. That book came out in 1973, so it's 50 years old this year. And for some reason... As a tiny kid, I, that was a book that I took off the shelf. It, it was interesting that it had silver uh, lettering on the mm -hmm. spine and little icons, a harp, and a, 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 what I would come later to recognize as a Chico hat. And, oh, well, this is interesting. And, you know, I started looking through it and I saw all these pictures. And the photographs of the Marx Brothers were just something to grapple with. And it seemed a little familiar to me. My world was uh, the Muppets and Dr. Seuss and uh, Maurice Sendak. You know, the Marx Brothers appeared in these photographs like, you know, there was some continuity there. And um, I also found them a little scary, you know, Groucho in particular. That's, a, that's quite a face for a child to reckon with. So that was a book that I looked at a lot when I was a, just little more than a baby. I wouldn't really see the Marx Brothers in their movies until I was 12. Partly that's because, you know, I'm just old enough to have had a childhood where it wasn't so easy to find old movies. Um, and I sort of had to wait for home video to come along. And when it first came along, uh, it's not like all 13 Marx Brothers movies were at, at the local blockbuster. It was that that journey, you know, that constant searching for, for things that um, characterized uh, Life in analog, in the analog world. Yeah. So it was very gradual. And in between those two times, and I'll, rather than blow your whole episode on this answer, I'll, I'll wind <laughs> this up. But, but uh, 
in between like the very little boy looking at pictures in Joe Adamson's book and the 12 year old finally like seeing duck soup and a night at the opera on video, there were many years where the Marx Brothers always seemed to be right around the corner. You know, I would encounter them in Mad Magazine um, or, uh, you know, adults I knew might refer to them. And I, I, you know, I sort of came to understand that the nose and mustache and glasses had something to do with Groucho. And, uh, you know, they were, uh, I was aware of them as a kind of vapor um, increasingly during those, um, I guess, uh, nine or 10 years between discovering the book and seeing the films. Jim, how about you? Where did you first encounter them? I was an enormous, and still am, a Laurel and Hardy fan. And there was a local television show here in the Twin Cities where I live uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, hosted by uh, a former television, uh, uh, child's uh, television uh, host uh, named John Gallus, who played Clancy the Cop. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and so I came to the Marx Brothers kind of grudgingly, because I was such an enormous, uh, and still am, Laurel and Hardy fan, that I poo-pooed the Marx Brothers for many, many years. And because uh, I started watching Laurel and Hardy as a little kid, I mean, seven, eight, nine years old, I every Sunday morning, I would rush home from church and plop down in front of the TV to watch Laurel and Hardy. Uh, they were sort of uh, my comedic touchstones, if you will. Yeah. And and then the Marx Brothers were uh, kind of off to the side for me. And 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 I went to the Uptown Theater, John, here in the uh, Minneapolis area. You crossed and, the river from St. Paul and came all exactly. the way to Minneapolis. You must have really been interested. Oh, well, I only go across the river for work. And this was a, a point where I was not working yet. And, and I saw <laughs> A Night at the Opera and, uh, you know, was convulsed and then devoured everything I could get my hands on after that. The Marx Brothers were eye-opening for me just in terms of, oh my gosh, this whole thing is so different. I was reading in this, in your book that uh, Frank Ferrante said, I was raised by Catholic nuns and I wanted to I wanted to sort of do to the Catholic nuns what Groucho would do to Margaret Dumont. <laughs> and I was like, well, that that's exactly right, because I, too, was raised by Catholic nuns. And that sort of energy was really attractive to me as a sophomore in high school. And, and so I fell in love with them. And then, you know, anything I could get my hands on, I, I watched and read and I love them to this day. And I still love Laurel and Hardy quite a bit, too. Yeah. OK. Did, did Noah, did you find that uh, this is just my own experience and I'm wondering if you guys have had the same thing that that entering the world of the Marx Brothers was actually a gateway to a whole bunch of other interesting stuff I mean you get into the Algonquin table you get into I got into Benchley and Perlman and into all the plays of Kaufman and you know you're reading Moss Hart and all of a sudden you look at the New Yorker because you know he was there when they said I mean did you find that you just it sort of was a spider web no doubt about it. Yeah, that's very true. But partly it's learning about them biographically and the times they lived in and the circles they traveled in. And partly it's, you know, in order to understand the references in their films. Yeah. Um, that's one of the great things about, you know, sophisticated verbal comedy. It's an education. And particularly if you're a kid, yes, um, <laughs> through uh, comedy and, and show business in general and the Marx Brothers uh, in particular. I learned, uh, you know, <laughs> I hesitate to say this, but probably just about everything else I know <laughs> from following, you know, tributaries from the Marx Brothers. Do you remember the first time you performed as Groucho? And I don't mean like a, I mean, certainly Halloween is fine, but I mean, it, where you actually donned everything and, and had a script? Yeah, the first time I, I played Groucho in front of an audience was in a talent show uh, a school talent show in, I think, seventh grade. Wow. Uh, and I I performed with my brother and sister uh, as Harpo and Chico. Uh, they're, they're both a little younger than me. And um, by the time we became the Marx Brothers, they were so accustomed to, you know, involuntary service in my stock company. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, they were veterans by that time. They had done living room productions of Fiddler on the Roof where they had to play everyone but Tevya, you know. So, 
<laughs> so uh, all right now, now i'll wear the this wig and speak in this accent or not speak at all if, if that's what i got to do to get through this day um and we did uh the contract routine from a night at the opera with a little bit of harpo stuff thrown in in order oh, yeah. okay freedom. fantastic jim how about you first time in front of an audience yeah, first time in front of an audience as Groucho was really the first time I played Groucho. So uh, I have a, in the same way, John, that I have a deep and abiding love and respect for the art of magic and want to see it, want to read about it, don't want to perform it because it's, it, it is a thing in to its unto itself. And if you do it poorly, it's, horrible and so i love to see it i just don't love to perform it and i felt the same way about groucho so i went kind of kicking and screaming to a uh a staged reading of uh the coconuts that illusion did and we really just carried our scripts uh because there was just a couple three rehearsals but we read the whole thing and uh, sang some of the stuff that was in it and then that morphed from there into an actual production of uh, the coconuts and uh, we did it uh, both at the illusion theater in minneapolis and then it moved uh, uh, to the fitzgerald theater in st paul which uh, was not the fitz well it was the fitzgerald when we did it but when the marx brothers performed there i think it was called the world theater yes, so was. i was it, it, uh, very um I love that kind of thing. I love standing where Wyatt Earp stood or standing where William Shakespeare stood. And so to be doing a play that Groucho did on a stage that Groucho did it, um, I should have gotten out of the business right then. I should have said, it's, I've done it. That's what's left. Excellent, excellent uh, stories on that. Noah, have, have you ever done the coconuts or animal crackers? Uh, I haven't done the coconuts. Uh, I would love to. Animal crackers, I've I've half done. Uh, one of the, uh, a subsequent childhood Groucho appearance was um, when I was 14 years old. I, um, I had a relationship with this community theater. I, at this point, I was living in South Florida. Um, I spent the first part of my life in Connecticut and then lived in South Florida when I was a teenager and New York since I uh, grew up. And um, this was in the Florida years. And um, I there was a, a, a local theater in a town called Coral Springs. It's not there anymore, but it was called Opus Playhouse. And it was a great place that uh, helped me a lot, you know, and gave me a chance to put on shows and and uh, learn how to do things. And I just wanted to do animal crackers. And so I did a bootleg production, completely unauthorized. Um, I didn't even have the script. I, I just wrote the movie down line by line to have a, a script of animal crackers. Um, and and so, so I've sort of done it, but you know, I, I really shouldn't put that on my resume. I was, I was 14 and- It uh, counts for me. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who's willing as a 14 year old to go line by line through a movie and write it down. You you did the show in my book. So that the desperate measures we had to take in those days. <laughs> there was no internet. We that's right. Uh, little well, kids writing down movies, you know. Exactly. Exactly. It's charming. It's absolutely charming. So what is it, Noah, that draws you to, to playing Groucho? What is it about that that guy? Yeah, what is it? I know. It's funny. What is what is it about Groucho is a question we could grapple with forever, even aside from the question of why try to be him. Yeah. You know, I think one thing that I, I is definitely true is that as soon as I saw the Marx Brothers and heard his voice and watched him moving around and interacting, uh, the urge to be him or at least to behave like him was immediate. I mean, it, it was right there. Now, I was already a kid who was, you know, a, a little ham and a performer. And, you know, that was the kind of I would be inclined to find my role in anything, you know, anyway. But yeah, nothing, no character other than myself ever grabbed me the way Groucho did or, or ever has, really. Um, and I think part of it is what you mentioned, Jim, uh, that uh, Frank Ferrante has said, part of it is the instinct to rebel against authority. And that, that's unquestionably part of the Marx Brothers Act. And and a big part of the Marx Brothers appeal, I think, to kids. 
Uh, but I think I think it's a little more like um, watching a great violin player and deciding you want to play the violin. It just seemed to me that as far as uh, embodying a character and getting laughs and singing songs and it just nobody ever did it like him. Nobody ever um, seemed to be speaking directly to my sense of humor and my sensibility. I just wanted to talk in that voice, you know, I wanted to play that instrument. Yeah. Jim, what about you? What drew you? Uh, nothing. I, I don't, uh, I, I uh, really truthfully, I did not want to do it. I still don't <laughs> want to do it, but I would do it again tomorrow if somebody asked. It's, um, I think it is a, uh, it, it is a, um, trying to find your way to entertain an audience through somebody else is tricky for me. I'm better at playing me than I am at playing anybody else. And so uh, the, the the desire to play Groucho, I have sort of put inside me and I have, and I, all the time, I use Groucho's sensibility without the grease paint and, or I, I like to believe that I do. I, I'm not, I'm certainly not in Groucho's league, but what I've gleaned from Groucho, I, I want to use uh, in some way. And I think Lawrence Olivier said, it's it, steal from everybody and no one will know. Uh, and, and, and so I have, and uh, the, but the desire to put on the grease paint and wear the frock coat uh, it, it is akin to me saying I want to do a magic show. I, I just I love to go to a magic show. I love to watch a Marx Brothers movie, but I really uh, kicking and screaming I would go <laughs> to play him again because it's just so it, 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 the mantle is so huge and heavy, and I don't think that I'm particularly serviceable. Uh, as a as Groucho, and it wasn't until I, we were halfway through the run of the coconuts when uh, when a light bulb went off in the dressing room while I was putting on the makeup that there's a difference between being faithful to the script of the coconuts and what we learned, and being faithful to the Marx Brothers sensibilities if that makes sense there's the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law and about halfway through that run i started doing things that i felt were more attuned to the spirit of the marx brothers than the letter of the script so i was calling other actors onto the stage i was going out into the audience i took a guy out and put him in a cab one night and just, I mean, stuff that sort of that anarchy that, that people talk about when you read about the Marx brothers in their heyday about this, or Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin in their heyday, I don't know what's going to happen. And I want to be there because mm -hmm. anything, it, you just don't know. And, it, and for all I know, it was the exact same show night after night after night and they just gave the impression that it was crazy but that idea for me it, it still percolates this the the idea of am i creating a museum piece or am i trying to in some way channel that anarchy for an audience and and i certainly the other show that i do that you know that has some relevance here is we do a production of it's a wonderful life uh at christmas time as a live radio play and that too what am i doing are, are we trying to are we trying to capture the movie or are we creating something different uh, or what's the so finding that sort of craziness is what i was most intrigued by and still am there's not a lot of roles like that, you know, like if you're playing one of the Marx Brothers in in Coconuts or Animal Crackers or I'll Say She Is, it's not the same as playing. It's not like you're playing Groucho Marx in a in a biographical piece about his life, um, nor is it like playing Sherlock Holmes, you know, a very familiar character who 
where there is room to to make it your own. I, I suppose people have done that with Groucho too. Um, but generally, if you're in a production of one of the Marx Brothers shows, it, the assignment is to you know try to make the audience feel like you know if they squint, maybe they're watching the Marx Brothers. Now, right. when, Noah, when you tackle the the formidable and important task of of recreating, resurrecting, bringing back to life, I'll say she is. Were you having that same sort of thing Jim was talking about, about balancing the the reality of what may have happened that you don't really know for sure and the spirit of it? How did you how did you approach? Well, first, why did you pick that show? And then how did you bring it back to life? Can I and, and can I back up because the three of us at this table are enormous Marx Brothers fans. So if you say I'll say she is, we have a frame of reference. But people yes. listening to this may think go what the hell is i'll say she is so can you start with that can you start with what is i'll say she is and how did you come to it because i i i think for for the layman who's not a huge marx brothers fan they don't they don't even know what we're talking about yes absolutely uh the the uh the in a nutshell version is that the marx brothers although primarily remembered for their movies were already halfway through their career by the time they ever made a film. Most of their lives were spent on stage. They had a long period in vaudeville. And then in the 20s, they became Broadway stars. And that was really the beginning of the Marx Brothers as a phenomenon we would recognize. Mm -hmm. And they did three Broadway musicals. The first was I'll Say She Is, a thinly plotted review. And the second was The Coconuts. And the third was Animal Crackers. By the time they were making talkies, they had these two very prestigious vehicles, Coconuts and Animal Crackers, written by George S. Kaufman and Mari Riskind, with scores by accomplished composers, Irving Berlin and Kelmar and Ruby. And there was no question but that those would be the first two films. And as a result, I'll say she has just kind of faded into history. It was the show they'd never made into a movie. And uh, no script survived, or at least no complete intact script survived, so that if you were a kid like all of us or, or you know, all the Marx maniacs out there, reading every book you could get your hands on and learning everything you could about the Marx Brothers, I'll say she has just had a sort of intrigue about it. What was that show? Uh, everyone knew from those books that the highlight of the show was the Napoleon scene in which Groucho played Napoleon and the other brothers played the various consorts of Josephine who are always materializing every time he turns his back. And uh, that scene was touted as like, that's really the arrival of the Marx brothers. That was the essence of them before they ever met George S. Kaufman, you know? And so, I mean, it's just such a tantalizing thing if you love them. And I think because I love the theater and I love musical theater. Uh, a lot of my other interests are also right in the bullseye of I'll say she is, you know, Broadway, New York City history. I'm a big fan of the culture of the jazz age in the 1920s. And, you know, this was just so appealing to me. So every time a new book about the Marx Brothers would fall into my hands, the first thing I would do is look up I'll say she is in the index and read all the I'll say she is stuff first and just had a little obsession about it. In the Marx Brothers scrapbook, which is a, a book I'm sure familiar to both of you and many of the fans, that book uh, reprints the entire opening night uh, program from I'll Say She Is on Broadway. And when I was 12 years old, I took that book to the library and photocopied it and cut out the pages and made myself a little <laughs> program so that I could you know, pretend that I had seen I'll Say She Is at the casino. Fast forward many years and I'm um, an adult doing theater in New York. Um, my wife and collaborator Amanda Sisk and I were doing um, political satires, uh, writing these musicals that would be ripped from the headlines. And we did that for a long time before realizing that um, the time it takes to develop a musical is too long for topical, for material that topical to, so we could never really perfect our work. And we decided to stop doing those shows that it was a bit of a dead end for us creatively. And I found myself after many years of doing one thing, trying to figure out, well, what's my thing gonna be now? And I think it was 
probably inevitable that I would just sort of go home to the Marx Brothers. Well, let's do a Marx Brothers show. Um, I haven't done that in a while, you know. I, I don't know, it, it seems a little bit uh, silly to call something so unlikely inevitable, but I just think I was hurtling toward it, you know, from the day I picked up Adamson's book when I was, you know, three or four years old. It, it had to have been both a joyful and frustrating experience as you tried to recreate something that uh, doesn't exist. So, you know, you know, that Napoleon sketch, we did a version of that Napoleon sketch. The only line I can remember from that Napoleon sketch uh, was, I'll be in Paris tomorrow. Don't wash. <laughs> That's the only line I can remember from the entire show, I think, of, of, of that. But uh, but it, uh, what fun to try to create that. Did you have a just a was it super fun or was it super frustrating or was there a combo? What, what was that like? Um, it was fun. I mean, writing is always a combination of both of those things, you know. It's a uh, uh, Stephen Sondheim once called it agonizing fun, you know, and that's kind of that's kind of what almost any writing process is. This one, I I wouldn't have uh, taken on the idea of doing I'll Say She Is if, 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 it, if enough of it didn't survive. And based on how much of it seemed to have survived uh, before my research, I, th I think what I was really thinking is that I would maybe try to write a book about I'll Say She Is and, and maybe figure out some way to do the Napoleon scene on stage. But realizing that it could be a show again, that happened kind of slowly as material started to accumulate. Uh, yes, the Napoleon scene has survived and that's been known for a long time. Also the first scene in I'll Say She Is is one that's familiar to Marx Brothers fans because it was an old vaudeville piece that they filmed in 1931. Uh, so that's the theatrical agency scene. I want to speak to Mr. Lee. I'm a dramatic actor. So I see. I'm Mr. Lee. Well, lend an ear to me. Can you play a role? Can I play a role? Do you know who you're looking at? No. Caesar's ghost. I play any kind of a role. You will? Now eat it up like that. I played a part in Ben Ho once. What part did you play, sir? A girl. She played the part of Ben. And you? I played her. When you go out, take a slam at the door. You're kidding me, aren't you not? Kidding, you say. I've been here all day. Now show me what you've got. I wanted to play a dramatic part, the kind that touches a woman's heart to make her cry for me to die. Did you ever get hit with a coconut's pie? There's my argument. Restrict immigration. I think I'll recite. Let it go. All right. I'll give you a recitation. Or would you prefer to see me give my chevalier imitation? When the nightingales could sing like you, they sing much sweeter than they do, because you brought a new kind of love to me. Well, what do you think? Get me a brick. Here's a brick. I always carry one for this invitation. Hey, I don't know. Lay this one on your head. You can't do that. You don't belong to the bricklayers union. So those are two big pieces of material that were a given. And then as for the rest of it, I became aware by relying on the work of other researchers that there was a typescript of I'll Say She Is at the Library of Congress. Also another slightly different one at uh, the American Musical Theater Institute run by Miles Kruger. And I was able to get my hands on the typescript. Um, now it is, on one hand, you'd say, oh, it's the script of I'll Say She Is, but it isn't quite that. What it is, is a 30 page document that they went into rehearsal with. And, you know, going into rehearsal with the Marx Brothers. Yeah. It's an outline with dialogue. It's, it's uh, what we would now refer to as a treatment. And there are there is some dialogue in it, some of which is recognizable from later Marx Brothers projects. Um, some of it is very sketchy. Of course, almost everything Harpo does is merely indicated. You know, stage directions like Harpo business. You know, yeah, uh, or or sometimes you know business with hat. Uh, but this this provided something like twenty percent of the dialogue and the continuity for I'll Say She Is. And there were no lyrics in it, but it did specify where the songs would fall. So my first attempt to write a script for this was a combination of material from that typescript and things learned from the playbill, uh, from reading you know, every account of I'll Say She Is I could find in books and interviews. Um, and then I started to search old newspaper archives 
which was just getting easier to do at this time. I, I was embarking on this like sort of major, I'll say she's research period around 2010. Um, and, you know, it was just sort of possible to, to read decades worth of old newspapers on the internet. And it's gotten much easier since then. So by reading every review I could find, every city I'll say she has had played in 1923 and 24 and 25, um, I started to realize um, there's material here. You know, there's reviews that quote dialogue or describe scenes that aren't in the typescript and that I didn't know about before. And that, you know, maybe nobody did unless they've read this copy of the New York Clipper from 1924. Um, you know, and, and then the songs, you know, I would, some of the songs from the original I'll Say She Is were published in 1924 and um, it was fairly easy to get my hands on those, but that represented only about half the score, maybe a third of the score. And a number of the original songs are, remain missing. And of those, I did manage to find a couple and to fill in the gaps, I found other songs written by the same people. Will B. Johnstone um, was the lyricist and all Marx Brothers fans will know him as a screenwriter on some of their later films. And his brother, Tom Johnstone wrote the music. Uh, well, the Johnstones also wrote, you know, six or seven other Broadway shows during the same period. So I was able to find some of those songs and interpolate them and um, do a sort of general polish on the lyrics, um, on the surviving lyrics. And then when I was bringing in other songs, uh, sometimes I would write the lyrics. You know, I, we gotta have a song. I know there was a song here and I know what it was about. So I'll write a lyric about that. Um, and whenever I had to do that kind of thing where I would invent something to fill a gap, I would always try to do it very conscientiously um, by relying on what I knew about the Marx Brothers Act up to 1924, and also by immersing myself in Will B. Johnstone's writing. You know, he's an interesting, uh, very unsung artist too, and he was a very prolific newspaper writer and cartoonist and did a little bit of everything. So by reading everything I could get my hands on by Johnstone, it made it a little easier to write what he would have written for them. That's just fascinating. It, it really is. It, 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 the whole thing to me is is it, so titillating and so exciting that even though I say never really want to do Groucho ever again, if you said I'm going to send you a copy of Alsatia's, uh, I I I I'd produce that. I'd be in that. <laughs> I put that up right now. I mean, that could happen, Jim. You, you know, I, I think what you said earlier, Jim, about the like playing Groucho, you feel like there's this mantle of greatness that is is impossible to live up to. I, I I feel that way too, and and you know, it is impossible. I mean, playing Groucho on stage, you're kind of making a deal with the audience, like, hey, we both know I'm not I'm not him. I'm not nobody will ever be that good right. um, at, at doing that. Um, but if you'll meet me in the middle, um, you know, I think I can fool you for a minute. And it's that same, and, and it becomes a sense of responsibility. Like that's it. You it's can't, the responsibility you can't that, that in. Me. And it's the same thing with, uh, you know, reviving I'll Say She Is. You know, if, if we're going to put that title on a marquee uh, and charge people money to see it, uh, boy, this better be the very best we can do. So once you started reconstructing it were you always planning on putting it on its feet well probably yeah well the answer is definitely yes i think the question is was i uh would i have admitted it to myself early on <laughs> i i do remember nibbling around the edges of it for a while before you know kind of looking it squarely in the face and saying we're, we have to do this we have to do this on stage um be for that very reason because it is so daunting um, you know, actually, it's daunting to produce a big musical, even Amen. even even without all the baggage and yeah. history and responsibility of of the Marx Brothers. And I'll say she is. Yeah, I looked at the pictures of of your production and was flabbergasted at the cast and, and how big the cast is and the costumes for the cast. It was like, uh, yes, this is oh, a big deal. One thing that was very lucky is you know, because of the nature of the project and because it's so interesting and historical and, you know, it attracted a lot of really talented people, uh, all of whom worked for, you know, 
much less than they deserved. Um, and the, the people who were willing to be part of it and, and wanted to be part of it. And, you know, we have sort of done it twice at this point. The, the Fringe Festival production in 2014 was the first, you know, uh, full staging. Um, and, and the book, Give Me a Thrill, is, is current through that production. Um, then in 2016, we, we did an off-Broadway production, which was larger and fuller and ran longer and was uh, uh, more, even more fully realized. Um, so, and, and there will actually be a, a new edition of the book covering that production. Um, but even that is now some years ago. And, you know, uh, there is in the future, I think, both an even bigger, even more 1924 faithful, I'll Say She Is. And I also think there may be a, a lightweight version of I'll Say She Is. I, I think we, we may experiment with that saying, oh, okay, it's a 1920s review. It has a line of chorus girls. It's spectacular. Um, but what if we did to it what Marx Brothers fans often want to do to the films and just boiled it down to just the Marx Brothers gold and yeah. did an I'll Say She Is Redux. Um, I, you know, there's two licensable versions of Animal Crackers now. There's a, a nine person, I, I may be getting the number wrong, but there's a small cast, mm -hmm. multiple role kind of version. And then there's the big full musical. You know, it's I like think... the the teeny Sweeney, the small yeah, version of teeny Sweeney Todd. Todd. It's the idea of of you of you uh, offering and creating a, a version that would be a little easier for most theaters to do. I think is really a smart idea. Knowing the Marx Brothers uh, and knowing coconuts and animal crackers, because of course they're enshrined uh, in celluloid, and we can look at them whenever we want. Uh, there's a a story. Uh, to both of those things that loose as it may be, I, I wouldn't say either the coconuts or animal crackers were a review. Uh, is, is the same true of I'll say she is, is, is there a, is it, or is it a review where we're just going from sketch to sketch to sketch or song to song to sketch, and they're not connected by a, a through line the way coconuts or animal crackers are. It's, it's an interesting question, and, and um, the answer is kind of both. You know, uh, one thing that has happened is I think the word review is now understood more narrowly than it was in yeah. the Marx Brothers day. When, when we use the word review now, we, mean, we generally mean exactly what you're describing, um, a variety kind of evening um, with a series of unrelated sketches or songs. Um, but... The, the truth is, in the 1920s particularly, um, reviews tended to have either thin plots or themes that tied them together. Um, that's, that's exactly what distinguished a Broadway review or what would have been called rather snootily a legitimate review. Uh, that's what distinguished it from vaudeville, which really was one act after another. Yeah. And, you know, what the, the third on the bill does on stage has nothing to do with the content of what was second on the bill. Uh, a lot of these Broadway reviews, um, including the Ziegfeld Follies, they they would be built on themes um, or plots. Um, you know, a, an example would be as Thousands Cheer, Irving Berlin's famous review. It doesn't have a plot that runs all the way through it, but each piece is based on a news story of the day. You know, um, it's not just a collection of songs. I, I, in the case of I'll Say She Is, it was a thinly plotted review. And the thin plot is a bored heiress is looking for thrills. Mm. That's the plot. You know, I'm not saying, I mean, it does make, it makes coconuts and animal crackers look very sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it begins with a, a, a breaking news that a society woman craves excitement. You know, she has promised her hand, her heart and her fortune to whoever can give her the biggest thrill. You know, it's very saucy stuff. So each scene or, or musical number in the show is, you know, vaguely an attempt to give her a thrill. And it's kind of like a clothesline you can hang anything on. So the, the Napoleon sketch, in, in the context that was provided for it in 1924, is a fantasy sequence where, you know, the ingenue fantasizes that she's in the court of Napoleon. Um, and that's that's the attempt of the hypnotist to, to give her a thrill, you know? Um, so in order to um, 
make the show a little more uh, compact and a little more accessible, in my adaptation, I did nudge it a little closer to being a, a, a book show. You know, I did, I strengthened the plot a little bit. I, I just added some reinforcements, you know, some undergirding to the plot. And there were some uh, things in the show that weren't connected to the plot, but could have been. Um, I made some little connections there. And uh, also some of the sequencing um, was a little perverse uh, in terms of how the evening built. Um, and uh, I thought with the help of many people who worked on the show with me, but uh, I'll mention Trav S.D. and Amanda Sisk, who had a lot to do with the development of the script, you know, figured out that yeah, the Napoleon scene really should go at the end of act one, you know, and the courtroom scene should go at the end of act two and little concessions like that to make a contemporary audience feel some sense of satisfaction. But so you both do such a nice job of Groucho, even though one of you uh, has to be dragged into it kicking and screaming. What is, from your experience, what is the hardest part of being Groucho on stage? Uh, well, for me, I think the the most challenging part is the physical performance. That's the part I work on the most. And when I see video of myself as Groucho, that's the part, if, I'm, if I notice things to improve on next time, they're usually physical things. I, I think it, that may have something to do with my particular skill set. I'm very comfortable vocally. I, I like my vocal version of Groucho. It, it sounds the way I, it sounds the way he sounds to me. And I, I generally feel confident with that, although off nights do happen. But physically, uh, being him physically, you know, partly because he was so verbally overwhelming, we often overlook what an interesting and unusual and brilliant physical performer Groucho Marx was. And I can't think of anyone who moved the way he moved. His Both his physical body was unusual, his shape, uh, and the way he, especially in the early films, yeah. he like has no gravity. He's mm -hmm. sort of weightless. There is a tendency to over, uh, to make him too manic um, and to try to match his impact by being loud and fast and, um, very abrupt in your movements um, or overly precise. He, he wasn't that precise, actually. He was pretty sloppy in the way he moved, but it was a graceful sloppiness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and, and the difficulty of putting it into words that you're experiencing with me right now is, is part of where the challenge is. Uh, there are times when I, I feel good about the physical performance um, and I, I nail something, a move of his that I've been working on, but I, I think that's the part that's the most challenging. Okay, Jim, how about you? What what did you find most challenging? You know, uh, what I found most challenging, dealing with the mantle of Groucho, not just the audience's expectations of what that means, but more problematic, my own belief system about what I'm capable of and how far short of what the man was and did on stage, I my version of him is. So uh, for me, it was always, I always had to really kind of get myself ramped up in order to believe that, okay, I'm going to go on and I'm going to do this. And it's, you know, it just, uh, it, it was a constant battle for me every night before I would go on. Am I capable of this? Do I, am I, but is there anything about this that's even moderately entertaining for an audience? And and I just couldn't get by that. And I still can't. I, you know, I, I still can't get get that out of my head. Now, I, I, I separate that for a second and set it aside. And I talk about It's a Wonderful Life. I'm very happy with what I've achieved in It's a Wonderful Life. Very happy with with what I've done me personally and the show in general but but my performances I'm I'm very happy and satisfied with them and love to do them and can't wait till December comes around so I can do it again but the March Brothers thing is a there's a dip, there's a there's a fear factor I guess that I'm going to let him down in some way and I can't help but let him down there's a certain uh, love and respect I have for him in the same way that I have love and respect for magic that I just don't want to be a bad Elvis impersonator, I guess is, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? 
that's that's what I don't want to do. Uh, there's a big difference between Elvis and the best Elvis impersonator. And you can have joy in both. But, right. you know, Groucho is so far and nothing against Elvis. Please, if you're listening to this podcast and you think I'm about to dis Elvis, you're right. But I don't mean it that way. There's a there's a vast difference between what Groucho was on screen and what Elvis was on screen. Yeah. Elvis yeah. could yeah. sing. Groucho could do anything. And and that's the difference. And and it and I can't do anything. I can barely sing. So it, it's it's that's I'm lucky enough to have done it, and I'm happy to have done it. And I I I like when people talk to me about it. Oh, I saw you as Groucho. You were excellent. And I want to say, uh, apparently, you you don't know the Marx Brothers movies at all. <laughs> I wasn't, but so that, that's I'm, a very Groucho response. Is that, <laughs> hey, you are great in that show. You have no taste, you know. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, oh, but I could do this all night, but we're not going to do it all night. I want to just wrap up with a couple uh, speed round questions, I guess. Just kind of general Marx brother, Marx brotheriness. Noah, do you have a favorite of the movies? Animal Crackers is my because favorite. because I think it's the closest we can get to seeing them as a stage act at the peak of their powers. Okay. Do you have a favorite of all the movies? Do you have a favorite scene? Yes. my I feel guilty because my favorite Marx Brothers scene only has one Marx Brother in it. Okay. Um, and I, I love Harpo and Chico and I even love Zeppo. And I, I, I have to say that, but my favorite scene is the strange interlude scene oh, in Animal Crackers. In Animal Crackers. If I were Eugene O'Neill, I could tell you what I really think of you two. Pardon me while I have a strange interlude. Why, you couple of baboons? What makes you think I'd marry either one of you? Strange how the wind blows tonight. It has a thin, eerie voice that reminds me of poor old Marsden. How happy I could be with either of these two if both of them just went away. To have, to have been there live, to have watched yeah. him do that, to see him step forward, I would rank that very high uh, for my favorite scene. Jim, do you have a favorite movie and a favorite scene? Yeah, I think so. I, and largely because it was the first, my first experience of the Marx Brothers. Nothing for me compares to A Night at the Opera. If I am clicking around and Night at the Opera is on, we stop clicking and that's what it is. And anybody who is in the house that my wife or the kids, uh, I'm sorry, but you'll either have to find another TV or go outside to play because this is, this is what we're going to be watching for a while. And, uh, you know, the line of Groucho's, uh, what happened? Oh, we had an argument and he pulled a knife on me, so I shot him. That right there, when I heard that the first time, I, I I was afraid I'd have to leave the theater. I started laughing so hard and I couldn't come back from it. It just kept coming to me. I kept thinking of that well past it and was giggling about it. And and so that whole, uh, belly up, put your foot up here. That whole thing to me is uh, as good as it gets. Yeah. One other little uh, alley I want to go down. Um, there's another great book. And Noah, if I get the title wrong, uh, please correct me. Is it uh, Four of the Three Musketeers? Is that yes. Name? Yes. Which uh, tracks in exhausting detail every stage appearance uh, of their their stage career. And it, as you look through it, we're all getting older, all of us three guys. And you begin to realize the weird gap or you think something was a long time ago. And it turns out it wasn't. Um, I was born in 1958 and realized just recently that Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was made a mere 10 years before I was born. In my mind, it's a, you know. And so the Marx Brothers on stage in the 20s or the late teens and 20s as they're traveling everywhere in the country, they came to Minneapolis a lot. They went yeah. to Duluth a lot. And, um, you know, a mere... 40 years before I was born, I could have gone and seen them. So my question to you guys is, you have a chance to see the Marx Brothers live on stage in that era. What is your pick? What do you go see? Do you have a time machine? You can go, you can go see one thing or two. I'll give you two because I have two. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. you're giving me two because uh, the obvious answer is, yeah. I'll say she is. And yeah, well, more. which is be one of my answer too now. So that'll be one answer. Bring your yeah. iPhone and hit record. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, but, right. Bootleg it. Nobody knows what an iPhone is anyway. <laughs> exactly. And then and then you just go right back to what you did as a 14 year old line by line. You just write that sucker <laughs> exactly. down. Exactly. Write it down. Exactly. OK, so your second choice after the obvious, I'll say she is. I guess it would be to see some of the even earlier stuff, you know, having satisfying the urge to see them at their best on Broadway. You know, um, there's a lot of curiosity about the act up really up to 1920 in in 1920 there's a, there's a big change or 21 really that's when groucho paints the mustache on and drops the german or sometimes yiddish accent he had been using before harpo and chico evolved more subtly but in a sense they were all playing somewhat different characters uh, in the early vaudeville tabs and so i, I guess i would want to see home again um which was yes. their vaudeville tabloid yes that um, carried them through the World War One years and beyond. Yeah, that's way up there. Jim, do you have a... Yeah, I, well, anything vaudeville. Uh, the the school sketches that they did, I, I'd see, you know, I'd see anything. I, I wouldn't matter to me. If I could get back there, I'd, I'd go every day. And, and what I'd be most interested, John, you and I were talking about Robin Williams and being the greatest improviser of all time. And the quote that you said was somebody had said, see the eight o'clock show, then see the 10 o'clock show and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. And and that to me, that's interesting. I, I would kill to, you know, follow them on the road like you did uh, 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 Bruce Springsteen and just see how much of it really is that sort of uh, in the same way that I'm tickled that somebody says to me, uh, you know, how, I, I can't believe I, how much of that did you just make up on the spot? None of it, essentially, did I make up on the spot. I'd like to see how much of what they did day to day was exactly the same and how yeah. much of it was today. I'm going to do this for no reason at all. And I, I'd like to see how much of that is different. You know, my my two choices kind of fall within that. One is the day that Chico's daughter didn't go to the show. And oh, yes. and she came home and Chico thought she'd gone to it. And he said, what did you think? And she said, what do you mean? And he said, Harpo and I, Harpo and I switched roles. And I know it's weird, you know, if you have like one chance to go see the Marx Brothers, why are you going to go see them <laughs> not do the role they're supposed to do? But it's just fascinating when you think, because the other one is when Groucho was sick and Zeppo stepped in. And um, if I'm quoting Susan Marx's book correctly, it was like the reaction was so strong to what Zeppo did that Groucho got healthy really, really fast and came back that Zeppo was really, really good. And, I, I you know, I we, we do have the uh, the agent sketch. So you get a sense of what they were like on stage. You, you do get that. But the idea of seeing I, I can easily see Zeppo doing Groucho, the idea of, of Chico doing Harpo and vice versa. I mean, that's that would just be I, I realize if I, have, if I have if I have a time machine, I should go back and do something more helpful for the world. But I, I'm, at that same time, I want to stop by and see that that one show where they switched. Yeah, that you do it over your lunch break while you're uh, while you're stopping World War Two uh, <laughs> on the way home. Swing in and see that show. You've earned it. That's a good answer. Yeah. Noah, thank you so much for chatting with us. What What's a charm. Happened? Just a just delight. Thank you so much. I had a great time talking to you. It's been a pleasure, fellas. Thank you for having me on. Hello. I must be going. I cannot say I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. La la. Thanks to Noah Diamond and my occasional co-host, Jim Cunningham, for stopping by to talk about Groucho. Check out the show notes for Noah Diamond's website, where you can find clips from his production of I'll Say She Is, buy his book, Give Me a Thrill, check out his podcast, the Marx Brothers Council podcast, and dive even deeper into Marx Brothers lore and history. Did you enjoy this interview? You can find lots more just like it on the Fast Cheap Movie Thoughts blog, check out the link in the show notes. Plus, more interviews can be found in my books, Fast, Cheap, and Under Control, Lessons Learned from the Greatest Low-Budget Movies of All Time, and its companion book of interviews with screenwriters called Fast, Cheap, and Written That Way. Both books can be found on Amazon. And while you're there, check out my mystery series of novels about the magician Eli Marks and the scrapes he gets into. The entire series starting with the ambitious card, 
can be found on Amazon in paperback, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook formats. And if you haven't done it already, check out the podcast companion to the books, Behind the Page, the Eli Marks Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that's it for episode 111 of the Occasional Film Podcast, which was produced at Grass Lake Studios. Original music composed and performed by Andy Morantz. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you occasionally. <laughs>